Hello. Welcome to Hopkins at Home. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Paul Fuchs. I'm the David Eber Rumenstein Research Professor and Vice Chair in Otolaryngology at Johns Hopkins. Um, my laboratory does research on the structure and function of the inner ear. And uh, today we're going to be talking about some of the basic cellular and molecular mechanisms that uh, give us our sense of hearing and how this knowledge leads on to emerging uh, strategies for therapy and repair. So please uh, have, uh, enter any questions you have into the chat box. I'd like to try to answer them as we go along. And we're going to try to save some time at the end for a more extended discussion. Uh, and so also uh, let me uh, apologize on, um, about the glitches. It's apparently some snow fell on the tracks. Oh, that's an obscure reference to England. But anyway, I think we're ready to roll now. Uh, so to begin, let's uh, go to the first slide and I'll tell you what I'm gonna talk about. So first I'm gonna say a few things about what sound is and how it is that we need to, how we need to analyze it. And then I'm gonna talk about the cochlea itself and the way in which it encodes frequency. And this leads us to a brief discussion about the wonderful benefit of cochlear implants for people that are profoundly deaf. Then I'm gonna move on to a more detailed discussion about the process by which the sensory hair cells of the inner ear convert mechanical energy sound into electrical signals. And that's the process of mechanotransduction. I'm going to kind of dive into that because we now know that there are a number of inherited uh, mutations in humans which give rise to dysfunction of the mechanotransduction apparatus and thereby offer us some opportunities for monogenic gene therapy. I'll talk about that. They'll move on then to talk about how the electrical signals generated in the sensory hair cells are communicated to the afferent neurons that carry information to the brain. And this has uh, some significance for another phenomenon of hearing loss, which is called hidden hearing loss. And perhaps more familiar to all of us would be the notion of people that are hard of hearing. They can understand speech in quiet environments, but not necessarily in noisy environments. Then I'm gonna move on. And then there are some opportunities there, we think for some uh, therapeutic advances. And then I'm gonna talk about another kind of neuron which uh, innervates the cochlea. And these are not afferent, but rather efferent. They reside in the brain and send their neuron processes out to the cochlea where they suppress the sensitivity. They regulate the gain of the cochlea. And we think these might have an important role to play in protecting the ear from noise and age-related hearing loss. And last but not least, I'll say a little bit about the real holy grail of all of our efforts to uh, treat the ear, and that is hair cell regeneration. Uh, we mammals, uh, unlike other vertebrates, do not have the capacity to regrow new hair cells, although fish and fowl do. Uh, and so that kind of distinction has led to some interesting ideas about where we might go to try to grow hair cells. So let's move on. What is sound? Well, of course, it's a vibration propagating through the air. It's a disturbance of the air that gets to the ear and contains different components of frequency and intensity. So what we need to know is what do we uh, pick out of that signal and how do we use that information to understand the auditory world around us? So in particular, an acoustic object, which is to say a word or a sentence or the difference between the sound of a cat and a dog, depends upon the unique combination of frequency, intensity, and timing that make up that acoustic object and the sounds that it emits. So one way of, des of describing these is to look at something called a spectrogram, which allows us to look at sound in terms of its frequency components, its timing, and intensity. So I'm gonna to try to show you one of those now. And I hope what you see now is a sort of marching gray smear across the screen, which represents the frequency components and their timing and intensity. Each of these dotted horizontal lines is a different frequency band at one kilohertz, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the microphone in the computer is picking up my voice. So you see this really complicated pattern of, of gray stuff. But in order to understand better how this works, let me give it a somewhat simpler sound, which is me whistling. So that's about a two kilohertz tone with a lot of harmonics. And then as the frequency changes, the position of those gray bars changes. So you see that the spectrogram gives us the frequency composition, timing, and intensity. 
So let's look at a real spectrogram of uh, a little bit easier to understand stuff. Uh, so now we're back to this set of statements. And here's a regular spectrogram of something, a sentence, I can see you. And you see that this is composed of a variety as the earlier spectrogram, the live one did, of different timing and intensities. Again, from frequencies of one to seven kilohertz. And I wanna point out two particular components of this sentence, which are these consonants or frictives that start off the words can and see. These are composed mostly of higher frequencies. So if you need to be able to, dis to distinguish this consonant from that one or from the vowels that follow, you need to be able to hear these higher frequency sounds. So that's critical. And so let's see how that relates to the human audiogram. That is, what sounds can we hear? This is a human audiogram. It means what are the sounds that we can hear as a function of frequency, the quietest sounds. So the threshold for human hearing in a young normal hearing human is this bottom purple line. So you see that these are the intensities that we can hear. By the way, this is a logarithmic scale. So we're looking at powers of 10. So sounds that we can hear in the environment range over about a million fold. And so this is the frequency uh, spectrum for a human. Now that's our ability to hear quiet, uh, pure tones in a quiet environment with no competing background noise. Conversational speech, the stuff that we normally listen to resides in this band, which looks sort of like a paramecium, ranging from about 100 hertz, maybe up to about five kilohertz. And the intensities range from this, these sorts of values. So here's what we're normally hearing and here's what we want to be able to hear. Now, what happens as we get older? You know that it's very common for age-related hearing loss to be present in a very significant fraction of the population. And that's expressed here in these audiograms, which compare the normal hearing uh, thresholds of young, good hearing humans to those as they get gradually older, the sort of average audiograms of people in their 40s, 60s, and 80s. The slight differences between men and women, men losing their hearing a bit more than women, at least historically. And you can see now that these thresholds are beginning to carve into the range of intensities and frequencies that constitute important elements of speech. So it gets harder to understand speech as we get older, not because we're necessarily losing our hearing, but we're specifically losing the high frequency components of hearing. And this is a, a common element throughout hearing loss. It tends to occur at higher frequencies first and then gradually spread to lower frequencies. So, Age-related hearing loss or presbycusis is characterized by the loss of the ability to hear high frequency sounds. This is particularly problematic in noisy environments and we'll hear more about that in a moment. Okay, so this is just reiterating that same point that the speech regime can be carved into by high frequency hearing loss as occurs during age-related hearing loss. So, when one has problems with hearing, you go to see the physician or the audiologist or whomever you go to, and they are first going to determine two important facts. What kind of hearing loss do you have in broad strokes? One kind is called conductive hearing loss, which basically means sound doesn't get into the inner ear. So this might be simply because of earwax or perhaps a middle ear infection, which re restricts the motion of the eardrum. Or over time, there can be something called otosclerosis, which is a scarring of the middle ear ossicles here, which communicate the vibration from the external ear to the internal ear. Most of that kind of problem can be relatively solved. So for example, you remove the earwax or you treat the inner ear infection, or there's even some uh, kind of surgical treatments for freeing up the motion of the middle ear ossicles. Much more problematic is the, the other form of hearing loss, which is sensory neural hearing loss. And this is where age-related hearing loss, noise-induced hearing loss, some other sorts of hearing loss resulting from ototoxic uh, poisoning can also affect the inner ear. So sound gets in, but it doesn't get converted into electrical signals to be sent to the brain. And that's much more difficult to overcome, but that's what we're gonna talk about today. So hearing therapy is now and in the future. Number one, prevention. Just don't damage your ears. Wear hearing protection whenever possible. If you have a 
gas-powered lawnmower, wear earmuffs. If you use a loud tool of some sort, wear earmuffs. If you go to the nightclub and love that loud sound pounding against your chest, put in some earplugs as well. So prevention is a big deal. It's essentially every form of hearing loss that we know about is exacerbated by acoustic overexposure. So prevention is important. Hearing aids can provide some help. As you know, they're not perfect, but they do provide assistance for many people with some degree of hearing loss. And for those with profound deafness, we have the cochlear implant that we'll show you an example of in a little bit of time. This is really an amazing prosthetic advance. And then in the future and what's happening now, what's being developed are strategies of gene therapy to repair or prevent hearing loss. And this is most uh, moving more forward most uh, quickly now for monogenic deafness, that is single gene mutations which are present in the human population. These are inherited forms of deafness. And we're beginning to understand what they are and how we might be able to correct them through gene therapy. And then we're going to go a little bit into the promise of hair cell regeneration. And we're looking at a little video which is made by these folks down in New Zealand actually, which allows us to look at how the ear works. Hood. And I don't remember uh, if I turned on the sound or not, but it doesn't really matter because this uh, guy is just repeating a bunch of nonsense syllables over and over again. Heard and those sounds heard are propagating into heard the external ear heard where they set up vibrations heard of the middle ear ossicles heard via the ear drum. Heard and that then causes fluid motions within the cochlea. So within the cochlea, if we look at this in a cross section, we're going to see the different chambers of the ear which heard. provide excitation heard. of the nerve fibers. Heard. It's these of yellow here that propagates heard. the brain. Heard. So the cochlea really does look like a snail shell, as the Greek word tells us. And within it, there are three parallel chambers, uh, which are divided by this structure called the basilar heard. membrane, on which is heard. sensory epithelium. Heard. And the vibrations heard. of sound cause heard. this little wiggling of the hairs. Heard on top of Head. these sensory hair cells, Head. generating an electrical signal, Head. which is communicated Head. then through a chemical Head. synapse to nerve fibers that run to the brain. And the heart Head. and soul of the cochlea is Head. the basilar membrane on which the sensory Head. epithelium resides, Head. because it is mechanically Head. tuned. Head. One end vibrates best for Head. high frequencies, Head. the opposite end for low Head. frequencies. And so Head. nerve fibers innervate the epithelium had both lines for frequency Hod. propagating that Head. information to the brain. So that same pattern that we just looked at in we move through at warp speed through the cochlea uh, is replicated in some detail coming up. So for a pure tone stimulus, that is a single frequency of sound propagating to the ear, the vibration pattern that resides that arises in the cochlea is maximal at one point along this frequency tuned structure. One single part of the cochlea vibrates maximally for a pure tone stimulus. This animation shows that again, this is from Hiroshi Wada at the Hoku University in Japan. And he did a computer model of the mechanical properties of the basilar membrane on which the hair cells are seated. So hair cells are seated all along this structure and they are innervated by neurons. And so pure tone stimulation sets up a traveling wave that looks a lot like a water wave. It approaches the beach and breaks at a point where it reaches its maximum. And the mechanical properties of the basilar membrane vary from end to end so that lower frequency waves propagate down to the more flexible, less stiff part of the basilar membrane at the very tip of the snail shell. But higher frequency vibrations peak at a point further from the tip of the cochlea and so there are, there's a systematic progression of best vibration frequencies along the length of the basilar membrane. So what this it, it shows again here is the same idea. As you move from the base of the cochlea down near where the stapes foot plate in, impacts on the cochlea, the bottom of the snail shell, there's highest frequency vibration. And at the very tip of the snail shell, there's the lowest frequency vibrations. And so the sensory hair cells, the things that convert that vibration into electrical signals are strung in rows all along that mechanically tuned structure. And they are uh, selectively innervated by neurons so that a nerve cell down here, which contacts hair cells in the high frequency end is a labeled line for 10 kilohertz. 
when it fires a signal to the brain, the brain says, oh, that neuron's firing must be 10 kilohertz. And then progressively lower and lower frequencies as you move up toward the tip of the cochlea. The great thing about this is that this means that this information propagates throughout the neuraxis all the way up to the cortex, where the auditory cortex, the primary auditory cortex, is found on the superior surface of the temporal gyrus, where there is basically a little picture of the cochlea that works exactly like a piano keyboard. No, it doesn't. But anyway, the idea is right, that there is a frequency map in the auditory cortex, which represents the spatial map of a little bit of epithelium. And that is super cool because that's exactly how the brain does everything. If you think about how we understand the meaning of a somatic sensation, it's based upon where that sensation occurs on the body surface. So there's a surface map. Same with vision. Our eyes report the location of an object in visual space according to which part, which area of the retina is stimulated. So the brain understands vision in a spatial map, it understands touch in a spatial map. And by this extraordinarily cool uh, function of the cochlea, which converts a frequency map into a spatial map, the brain can understand sound frequency in exactly the same way using the same rules of neural organization. I love the cochlea, as you can tell. Okay, plus, this really amazing transform that takes place in the cochlea also enables the most remarkable prosthetic device I think has been invented, which is the cochlear implant that can restore functional hearing to people that are profoundly deaf in the best circumstances. So again, I wanna show you how that works. The cochlear implant is a set of electrodes that gets inserted into the ear. So I hope what you see is a kind of a picture of a cochlea here with a set of electrodes inside it, each little white patch is one pair of electrodes, which is driven by a particular frequency component of sound. So there's an electronic device on the outside of the head that has a Fourier transformer. It breaks sound into its frequency components. Each component then drives a separate electrode. So if you now provide a suite of frequencies from low to high, you see that the electrodes are activated in turn from the apical tip of the cochlea down to the base and back again. You see how the electrodes are activated ones turn red as the frequency rises. Also, you can look at how sound ah, so. ah, so. speech sounds are included. Ah, so. This sound ah, so. ah, so, is ah, so. mostly vowel, ah, so. and it mostly ah, so. in the low frequency part. Ah, so. ah, so. The word choice as much choice restrictive choice information high frequency choice and it stimulates choice more than choice high frequency electric. choice choice so that's the cochlear implant that is a device a prosthetic device which has been a tremendous boon to providing hearing to people that are profoundly deaf um, and it's still being improved today as are hearing aids hope you can see that we're back to the picture of a cochlear implant and so now I talked a little bit about mechanisms involved in the, how the cochlea uh, results in the processing of sound, but I want to dive in a little deeper and figure out what are the molecular mechanisms whereby these operations occur. So we're going to take a cross section through the cochlea and look at the cellular elements. So it's a little more complicated. There's a lot of elements here that I won't go into today, but Basically, there's a lot of fancy mechanisms that provide specialized cellular and molecular activities. What we want to focus on here is what is the essential stimulus? And it turns out that as the, that traveling wave propagates along the length of the cochlea, it actually kind of does something sort of rocks from side to side, a little bit like that. The consequence is that there's an overlaying acellular tectorial sheet which differentially moves with respect to the underlying sensory epithelium, causing this lateral motion of the little hairs on top of the eponymously named hair cells. These are the sensory cells that convert a mechanical stimulus into an electrical signal. And you can see that as the cochlea vibrates, it causes the hairs to be pushed from side to side. And that's important because that is what causes an electrical signal. Now this 
drawing looks like something that came out of the art books of Rube Goldberg, but actually it's pretty accurate in most respects. The hair cell is able to convert mechanical energy into an electrical signal because it has ion channels, aqueous pores in the tops of the hairs with a gate that can be pulled open and closed. And that gate is pulled open when the hairs are pushed toward the right, toward the tallest hairs. That puts tension in this extracellular linkage, which pulls on the gate of the channel. <clears throat> when the channel opens, it provides an aqueous pathway for positively charged ions to enter the cell. So those positively charged ions, they cause a change in the membrane potential, the voltage of the hair cell. So this is the conversion. This is mechanical transduction. This is converting a mechanical force into an electrical signal by uh, the use of an ion channel that allows the flux of charged particles, ions. So the hair cell generates an electrical signal. Now we've learned a lot about how this works over the years and <clears throat> Uli Mueller, who's one of the professors here at Johns Hopkins is one of the leading investigators who have defined many of the molecular components of this structure. And there's a bunch of them. Uh, there are several dozen different proteins that participate in the mechanotransduction complex. And I'm going to talk about, I'm talking about them because we know that there are a number of human deafness genes, inherited forms of deafness, which actually affect some of these proteins. So I'll talk about one in particular because we already have animal studies which have shown that it's possible to repair that genetic defect by helping to correct the activity of this one here, which is TMC1 and 2. That's also shown here in this kind of blue inside the red circle. So TMC stands for transmembrane channel, a very inventive name. It is the aqueous pore. It has the gate. It allows the passage of ions into the hair cell to change the membrane potential. And there are mutations of TMC1. When it is mutated, some of these mutations cause deafness, both in humans and in mice. And so this has been a big target for gene therapy. It's a monogenic form of deafness. All you have to do is fix that one gene and you can restore hearing. And that actually has been done in mice already. And I'll show you just one example from the work of Jeff Holt up at Harvard. And others have done this too in the past. So this is an example of some mice that are called Baringo mice. I don't know where the name comes from. They have a mutation in the TMC1 protein and they cannot hear. So these are uh, the electrical signals that give rise to the audiogram that I showed you previously. This is the auditory brainstem evoked response. Uh, you can record it in humans by putting a couple of paste electrodes on behind the ear and on the back of the head. You get an electrical signal in the brain when sound successively stimulates the cochlea. So you can measure thresholds this way. These are just those electrical waveforms showing that the threshold in this wild type mouse, it doesn't have a mutation. The threshold is down here between, between 20 and 30 decibels of sound intensity. The Baringo mutant can't hear at all. There's no auditory brainstem response. If you take a virus and infect the inner ear of a Baringo mouse with a corrected form of the TMC1 gene, you restore hearing. So this is gene therapy. This is gene therapy using viral constructs, which are non-pathogenic viruses, to introduce the corrected genetic material into the cochlea. Now, it's not perfect. You can see that the thresholds are still not as good as the control animal, the wild-type animal, but it's better than it was in the, in the mutant case. So monogenic deafness for this protein, and actually now quite a significant number of others, has been successful in animal models. And there are human trials ongoing for similar sorts of studies. Well, you may have wondered, okay, you've got a gene you want to introduce to the ear. How do you get it there? I mean, you're not going to drink it, right? Uh, so where do you get, how do you get the gene there? You may be familiar with gene therapy for the retina, where people are actually injecting the genetic material right into the eyeball. And it works. It's, you know, local anesthetic. It sounds gruesome, but it's not. But the eye is right out here on the surface of the head. The inner ear is inside here in the really hard temporal bone of the skull. So it isn't easy to get to. 
And so thus far, people have been using surgical strategies to introduce genetic material or drugs into the inner ear by actually making a hole somewhere and then just injecting the materials directly in. Most uh, progress has been done by not injecting into the cochlea, but injecting into the fluid spaces of the associated vestibular epithelia. So I have a little model here, which was made by my son, Sam, when he was, uh, I don't know, 10, 12 years old. So it shows the external ear and it shows the internal ear right there. And so the surgery that one would do would be to simply make small incision through the skin, very delicately drill through the bone so that one can then access the semicircular canal quite close to the surface of the bone and inject your ther therapeutic agent right in there. And this works really well. I mean, it sounds crazy, but it works really well in animal models. So you can put in therapeutic agents without damaging the hearing. And as I said, the similar kind of strategy is being considered for human therapies. Now, again, it may sound a little bit extreme, but if you think about it, the, the um, surgery that is done to implant a cochlear, elect, cochlear implant electrode is actually a little more rigorous than that. Uh, so it isn't a really big surgery and it depends upon the benefit as to whether one would like to be able to proceed that way. But at the same time, there are other options that are being introduced. So there's something called nanoparticles, which are little lipid vesicles that contain DNA or other uh, agents of, of interest. So for example, these have been developed for uh, the vaccination regime that in, uh, for COVID in which the RNA is being introduced by uh, nanoparticle uh, use, uh, injection. So nanoparticles can bring in drugs, they can bring in big chunks of DNA, and that's been uh, looked at in the context of hearing therapies as well, particularly magnetic core nanoparticles, because those can be directed and driven by external magnetic fields. So that's another idea which is being explored. I would say that it's a long way to go, but injection of uh, material has been shown to be very effective in, corre in correcting monogenic deafness in mice. Okay, so what happens next? Um, you have this mechanotransduction process that changes the voltage of the hair cell. And that's shown very um, simply here in this picture, which tells us that as the bundle of the hair bundle of the stereocilia, the hairs on top of the hair cell are pushed from side to side, the voltage, the membrane potential of the hair cell alternately goes positive and negative. And that results in the release or transmission of a chemical neurotransmitter, which causes increased and decreased rates of firing of an associated afferent neuron. So signaling to the brain begins with mechanotransduction, an electrical signal in the hair cell, but then it gets converted into a chemical signal that sends that information to the brain. So this is a slightly more realistic picture of the innervation of the cochlea. This is a cross section like one I showed you earlier. But now the hair cells have been drawn in with white outlines seen here. There's two different classes of hair cells, <clears throat> excuse me, inner hair cells and outer hair cells. And there are a couple of different kinds of neurons. There are afferent neurons that carry information to the brain. And there are efferent neurons that bring information back from the brain to regulate the sensitivity of the cochlea. I'll come back to those in a bit. The intriguing thing, or many, one of many intriguing things about the afferent innervation of the cochlea is that the inner hair cells, which make up just one quarter of all the hair cells in the cochlea, this is a cross section. So these are rows that extend throughout the length of the cochlea. Overall, there's about 30,000 hair cells in total. And so maybe about 3000 or so of them are inner hair cells. These are the hair cells that send signals to the brain. That's because type one cochlear afferents make up 95% of the afferent neurons that carry information to the brain and they all connect to inner hair cells. In fact, each afferent, type one afferent has one synaptic connection with one inner hair cell. So everything an individual afferent neuron could tell the brain about the acoustic world comes from that one hair cell. Now, from the point of view of the hair cell, it has a whole team 
of type 1 cochlear afferents. In fact, the average number is about 20. So this inner hair cell sends a kind of multiplexed complex signal to the brain, which is carried on 20 individual lines or wires carrying that information to the brain. And they differ somewhat in their properties, but they all report the same frequency because this is just one point along the frequency tuned cochlea. Okay, so I wanna tell you a little bit more about that connection because that's another site of uh, pathology and uh, some ideas about uh, repair. So the hair cell, this inner hair cell has a bunch of afferent contacts. And at each of those contacts, there's a specialized, interesting looking synaptic structure, which releases the neurochemical glutamate, an amino acid, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter found throughout the nervous system. It is the excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain and the ear uses it to send signals from the ear to the brain. These synaptic structures have this kind of dense bar in the middle, and it's surrounded by these little clear vesicles, each of which is filled with the neurotransmitter glutamate. So here at the point of contact with the afferent neuron is where the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate is released as the membrane potential of the hair cell goes up and down and triggers the release of those vesicles. Now, why am I grinding on about this? Because it turns out that another one of the gene therapy strategies that was developed had to do with repairing a mutation in the protein that fills these little vesicles with glutamate. It's called a vesicular glutamate transporter, and its abbreviation is VGLUT3. Uh, and it's present in hair cells, and it is responsible for making sure that glutamate can be released by filling the vesicles but there are mutations where this gene is disrupted. And uh, Larry Lustig and uh, Omar Akil actually were one of the very first teams to show that gene therapy could be used to repair a monogenic defect. And they did that by restoring the function of VGLUT3 in a mouse model, which didn't have any VGLUT3. Now, then they, they also did the, um, audiograms and the ABR waveforms that I showed you before, but I wanted to show you a slightly different way of visualizing successful gene therapy, which involves using antibodies to label the protein that you expect to be produced by your gene therapy technique. And so that is done here in this picture, which shows that the hair cells in a cross section of the cochlea are labeled green by an antibody to the protein myosin, which labels those cells, and VGLU3, has an antibody that labels it red. So in wild type animals that have normal expression of VGLU3, you have a green hair cell that's also red, the combination is yellow. In an animal that does not have VGLU3, its hair cells are still green because it still has myosin, but it doesn't have VGLU3, it stays green. But then after gene therapy introduced by a virus, you can see that now we're back to having VGLU3 and the combination results in yellow. So that's another monogenic disease, which can be treated by gene therapy. But there's a much broader sort of problem about this synaptic connection between hair cells and afferent neurons. And that is that independent of genetic deafness, we know that another consequence of acoustic trauma and age-related hearing loss is not just the death of hair cells. It also turns out that these multiple synaptic connections onto an inner hair cell shown here in electron micrographs those multiple connections can degenerate and pull away. So the hair cell can be denervated, even though all the hair cells in the cochlea are still present. So this is a slightly different form of hearing loss because it's denervation as opposed to cell death. It's often called synaptopathy, pathology of synapses, and it's commonly called hidden hearing loss, or I would like to think of it as what we think of as being hard of hearing. Now it's called hidden hearing loss because someone may go to the physician or the audiologist and say, you know, I'm having trouble hearing in noisy environments. And they get their hearing tested in the quiet for pure tones and it turns out their thresholds are normal. They have perfectly sensitive hearing, but they can't discriminate signals and noise. Now, if you think back about the fact that each inner hair cell has 20 lines that carry information to the brain, what happens with synaptopathy is that half of them or some fraction of them are lost. 
So now your capacity to discriminate those fine details of a signal in a noisy environment is much degraded. And we know now that there is considerable evidence for age-related hearing loss to involve not just the loss of hair cells, but also denervation of the cochlea where the afferent neurons go away or the contacts go away. In fact, they don't die. The afferent neurons are still alive. They just don't have a connection. So many people are working to try to figure out how to prevent that from happening or repair it once it has happened. I'll just mention briefly that Elizabeth Gowatsky here at Hopkins has developed a really great model system with her postdoc, Philippe Vincent, where they can put uh, cochlear tissue in culture and cause it to be re innervated by either transplanted neurons or neuronal stem cells that they add to the dish. So they're using this as a model system to ask what kinds of molecular uh, tools can be used to facilitate that re innervation process. All right, so we've talked about the afferent innervation, and now there's one other kind of neuron I want to mention, which are the efferents that also innervate the cochlea. These reside in the brain stem, as shown in this picture. They are activated by sound. In fact, their activity level rises as the sound intensity rises. So they're sort of responding to sound. But what they do is feed back to the cochlea where they suppress the activity of the cochlea. They are inhibitory. They make synapses onto hair cells in the cochlea and they turn them down. Well, that seems useless. I mean, why would you want to degrade your sensitivity? The problem is this, our ears are very sensitive. We can detect sound in very, very, very low levels when our hearing is normal. But at the same time, we have to be able to hear in an acoustic world where sound intensities vary a million fold, a million fold. Each individual afferent fiber, if you ask what intensity range can it encode, it's about a hundred. So we have afferent neurons which can vary their firing over about a hundred fold range, but we have to be able to use them over a million fold range. So the efferent neurons, which are driven by sound, can turn down the sensitivity of the cochlea according to the intensity of sound in the acoustic environment. So it's a great device for extending the dynamic range of the cochlea in terms of encoding frequencies throughout that million fold range. Now, the other thing about the efferents, which is really quite cool, is that these efferents not only help with signal processing, but there's really good evidence from animal studies and some studies in humans that they also protect the ear from acoustic trauma. So they can prevent the onset of noise-induced hearing loss, and they can reduce the level of age-related hearing loss in animal models. And I'll just quickly uh, show you uh, at least uh, the last example of that so that I save a little bit of time. Uh, this is an example of mice which lose their hearing as they get older. In a mouse, that means when it's one year old, so they don't live very long. But normally in one year old mice, you have a loss of sensitivity. The acoustic thresholds shift up, as you see here, compared to the six month old mouse. But in this mouse, what was done here is to genetically engineer the efferent system so that it worked better than normal. So it increased the capacity of the efferent feedback to regulate and protect the ear from acoustic trauma. And in these animals, there was no age-related hearing loss. So we find this to be really exciting. This is work that has been going on in collaboration with uh, people we've worked with for many years in Buenos Aires, uh, led by Belen El Goshen, who cloned the molecular receptors for acetylcholine receptors and provided the ability to do genetic manipulation of that gene product. So we're now going forward with gene therapy strategies in animals to see if we can uh, help a mouse to avoid noise-induced noise hearing loss or age-related hearing loss by giving it this gain of function acetylcholine receptor, which makes its efferent system work better than usual. And that's work which is being done now by Dr. Zhang in, at Johns Hopkins. So hair cell regeneration, just a very quick couple of words about that. <clears throat> uh, we mammals don't regenerate our hair cells. So uh, we are in a tough place with respect to that. Once they're damaged and die, they're gone for good. But other vertebrates, fish, reptiles, amphibia, birds, they can grow new hair cells after damage. 
So many people have, been gone, have begun to look at the molecular mechanisms that regulate hair cell regeneration in non-mammalian vertebrates to find out what's gone on that changes the mammalian hair cell into one which can't regenerate. And I'll just mention Angelica Dutzelhofer here at Hopkins, who has been one of the leading scientists studying these sorts of molecular mechanisms and has made some steps forward to figure out ways to try to genetically manipulate hair cells and the surrounding non-hair cells which can serve as stem cells to produce new hair cells in the ear. And so that's the end of my talk. And thank you very much for your attention. It's been great to be able to talk to you today about how the ear hears and what we can do about it. Uh, so Ellen asks, why do hard of hearing people have ringing in their ears? What to do about it? Oh, wow, that's a toughie. So tinnitus is ringing in the ears. It's a common uh, consequence of hearing loss for many, many people. For some, it is really morbid. It can produce quite severe um, depression, uh, social avoidance, a variety of other sorts of problems. So tinnitus has been a, a really quite intractable problem for a long time. And there have been sound therapy strategies to try to decondition the ear and things of that sort. Uh, I think these are of limited utility. Um, I'm hoping that in the long-term strategies like we've been exploring with uh, enhancing the strength of efferent feedback might, may actually have application to pathologies like tinnitus and hyperacusis, but that's a little ways off for now. We're still trying to make sure that it works at the experimental level. Okay, Leslie asks, uh, is there anything promising on the horizon for uh, restoring or reversing nerve damage to the inner ear? Some folks have been looking into neuronal stem cells and trying to actually put those into the ear to see if they can regrow and make new connections. Uh, personally, I think this is really <laughs> expecting a lot of some poor little neurons that they not only would find their way to the ear, send their processes out to the ear, but also up to the brain to make their connections. But I will go back again to what Elizabeth Glavatsky has been doing, who is looking at an in vitro model to try to use neuronal stem cells to cause, uh, to produce regenerated connections in this in vitro animal model. And hopefully that'll give us some clues to do for what to do uh, in, in people. So uh, also from Leslie, would a cochlear implant be a viable option for someone with significant nerve damage to one ear and reduce auditory ability in the other ear, currently improved with a hearing aid? You know, I don't want to say too much since I myself am not a clinician. So the folks that do cochlear implant surgeries and treat hearing loss have uh, done a lot of work toward trying to figure out what's really optimal for folks with uh, partial hearing loss or one unilateral hearing loss, one-sided hearing loss, and to what extent cochlear implants can be uh, ut utilized. So the cochlear implant depends upon having nerve fibers to be able to stimulate. So if there's no nerve there, then the cochlear implant is not gonna be beneficial. On the other hand, if the other ear gets, gets worse and worse and hearing aids no longer are beneficial, then a cochlear implant on the other side might be beneficial. I'll just mention too, that there have been attempts to develop not cochlear implants, but brainstem implants, where the multi-electrodes are inserted into the part of the brainstem where the cochlear nerve enters the brain and stimulate the next stage of neuronal processing. Uh, that has not advanced terribly rapidly. It's been used to some extent in experimental studies in animals. There's no, as far as I know, there's not been a great deal of success with uh, human application. Bob asks, uh, long-term prognosis for tinnitus. I did talk about that. Unfortunately, as I said then, it's pretty tough. It's really intractable at this stage. Uh, I can only say that um, we hope that as we understand the molecular mechanisms that give rise to normal function and, and pathological function, we'll be better able to address such a problem. Uh, Joyce asks, is there any help uh, research children with uh, genetic disease neurofibromatosis type two? Uh, I'm sorry, I'll have to defer an answer to someone who has more clinical experience than I do since I'm not a clinician. So I don't want to make statements about things that I'm ignorant of. <laughs> uh, Carlos, what advancements are there in understanding causes of otosclerosis? What can be done to prevent it from moving from middle ear to inner ear? So otosclerosis is this process of scarification of the middle ear bones 
after, say, multiple courses of infection and th middle ear infections, for example, they can be surgically uh, uh, trimmed up a little bit, as I understand. And sometimes uh, there are middle ear uh, implants that can be used to restore motility. So the, the eardrum is then connected up to the cochlea by way of a prosthetic device. <clears throat> but um, as far as I know, otosclerosis per se ought not to move to the inner ear. Uh, otosclerosis is a scarification process that affects the motility of the middle ear ossicles. Now, whether middle ear inf infections might propagate into the inner ear is a different question, but that would be treated with antibiotics, not to do with otosclerosis. Uh, Marla, how to prevent future vertigo events. Oh, that's a great one, uh, since I have a little dizziness myself. Um, you know, I've only talked about the cochlea, of course, since we're talking about hearing, but the other part of the inner ear is equally important for the quality of life. Our, the vestibular system operates uh, at a molecular level in many of the same ways as the cochlea. There are hair cells and afferent and efferent neurons. And so gradually, as we learn more about the innervation mechanisms of the cochlea, I think these are going to be applied more and more to the vestibular epithelia as well. And it's my hope that by understanding better how we, the brain can control the inner ear, both in terms of hearing and balance, that we'll be able to better treat other pathologies like vertigo. Anita asks, are there devices for people who have hearing loss due to nerve damage from many years disease? Uh, I'll have to pass. I'm sorry that I don't know an answer to that question. Uh, Percy. <clears throat> Is there anything that can be done to improve hearing that's impaired within a certain frequency range? Yeah, so that's a, that's a specific uh, hearing loss. I mean, it's just something that, as I mentioned, in presbycusis, you begin to lose high frequency hearing first, and then it spreads lower and lower. Not really, I guess, would be the answer to that. So if there's a, a localized loss of sensitivity within just one narrow frequency band within the ear, Unfortunately, there isn't really anything at this stage that one could say you could address that problem specifically. You know, we're still at the point where we're trying to fix sort of global damage to the ear and localized damage like that, I think would, would be, require some novel strategies which have not yet been invented. Uh, what about the relationship from KE? What about the relationship between uh, ear issues and dizziness? Yeah, so we've touched on this already and I'll go back to it. Age-related hearing loss isn't the only problem of aging. <laughs> There's lots. Uh, the other one is uh, vertigo, dizziness. So the inner ear, you know, some of the problems that alter the capacity of the inner ear to perform hearing well also alter the capacity of the inner ear to perform the sensations necessary for adequate balance. And a lot of that has to do with something that I really flew over and didn't touch, which is that the inner ear isn't only specialize enormously mechanically and neuronally and cellularly. It also has these really unusual uh, ionic environments. So the inner ear has very specialized fluids that fill it. It has highly vascularized epithelia that generate those fluids. So a lot of the problems that we think arise gradually in terms of aging of the ear, for example, may have to do with the fact that just blood flow and the normal maintenance of the ionic homeostasis of the ear is affected. So that's gonna affect balance as well as hearing. And it's not surprising that there's combined effects for both of these kinds of problems. Whether <clears throat> there is uh, specific treatments that would affect balance versus hearing, of course there are. I mean, there's lots of um, uh, physical therapy strategies for doing better behavioral control of balance problems. Uh, and of course, there's lots of medicines that cause uh, dizziness that one can adjust the, adjust the dose regime to try to help with that. But again, um, we're still in the early days of finding the molecular mechanisms, but I do believe that the advances made in terms of looking at Genetic repair and drug repair of the cochlea are going to be equally, or at least informative for uh, repairing of the vestibular epithelium. Oh yeah, so Merle says, uh, uh, someone with hearing impairment seems to hear only part of what is said or, and has to make up the rest. Why, what's going on? Yeah, <laughs> ask my wife. <laughs> she has to tell me everything three times. Um, part of that's hearing. Uh, 
that's because we don't hear the first parts and we don't hear the frictives and we don't hear all of the necessary cues to put the information in context. So um, some of the frequency bands are missing, as I pointed out for presbycusis, or maybe just general hearing loss, whether it's frequency specific or not, just means that, that a lot of the information isn't achieved. What I notice in that context is that if I don't hear the beginning of the sentence, I don't know, I have really limited ability to figure out what the rest of it means. So a lot of times I think these are things that have to be dealt with initially by behavioral modification. That is to say, ask your partner or whoever's talking to you not to talk to you from the other room. Or if you have the patience, you just go to where they are and ask them to repeat and that sort of thing. So can we use, from an alumna, can we use hearing aids to slow down hearing loss due to damage? Uh, repaired eardrum and age. I don't know, that's an interesting question. You know, one of the things that is so remarkable about the cochlear implant is that this device, which typically has about 10 electrodes that are functional and can be used to, for the person, is replacing a nerve that has 30,000 channels. So the brain is dealing with a severe reduction in information carrying capacity, and yet has the ability to make sense out of the speech that is acquired that way. So does that mean that there's plasticity in the central nervous system? Absolutely. So the brain is learning to use a greatly reduced information stream to be able to understand the context and meaning of speech sounds. Does it mean that one can do better with a hearing aid so that you keep those parts of the brain in good shape? that normally are involved in diagnosing and analyzing speech, maybe. Maybe that the parts of the brain that normally are responsible for cognition of speech do change their plastic changes over time. We know that severe changes in sensory input can reorganize the cerebral cortex. So it's quite possible that at a more subtle level, maintaining the ability to acquire the sound will maintain the ability to analyze the sound. And that was the last one in the chat. Are there any other things that have popped up in the meantime? No other questions. Okay. Well, I really appreciate everyone who joined in to listen to me today, and I hope that you got something out of it. Uh, as you can tell, I am a real enthusiast about hearing and the mechanisms that underlie it. And I really am pleased that after working as a basic scientist for several decades, our work is now touching on potential therapeutic uh, benefits. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>